everybody. I'm, I'm Mike Lehman. I'm a counselor for the Society of Experimental Biology and Medicine. This is the first of three webinars that we have on this subject. I'm real grateful for Dr. Warren Grill for kicking it off. Uh, but we have fantastic speakers, and I encourage you all uh, not only to uh, pay attention to the speaker today, but also to tune in a week from today and two weeks from today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Lika Kulin, who's going to introduce Dr. Grill. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so my name is Lika Kulin. I'm a professor in biology at Kent State University, and it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Warren Grill. Dr. Grill is the Edmund T. Pratt Jr. School Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Grill received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees in biomedical engineering from Boston University and Case Western University. He has received numerous awards for teaching and mentoring. And, and I love that in Dr. Warren's bio, he lists those awards first. And I think he's very proud um, of these uh, awards specifically in his mentoring. He was also elected as a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering in 2007, elected as a fellow of the Biomedical Engineering Society in 2011, and awarded the Javits Neuroscience Investigator Award from the NIH NINDS in 2015. His research interests are in neural engineering and neuromodulation with applications to the restoration of bladder function, movement, and treatment of pain following trauma. He has published over 220 peer-reviewed journal articles and has been awarded 59 US patents. He serves on numerous editorial boards and is currently the deputy, deputy editor for the Journal of Neural Engineering. What's really notable is that Dr. Grill has also been able to apply his research findings um, towards application and treatment. And he is the co-founder, director, and chief scientific officer of NDI Medical co-founder, director, and chief scientific officer of DBI, and chief scientific advisor at SBR Therapeutics. In addition, he provides technical consulting to both small and large medical device companies, and serves as a consultant to the Neurological Devices Panel of the FDA Medical Devices Advisory Committee. It is my great honor to invite Dr. Grill to now start his presentation. We are very pleased to have you with us here today, Dr. Grill. Thank you so much, Dr. Coolen, for that uh, lovely introduction, and uh, thank you to you and Dr. Lehman and then the Society for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to begin sharing my screen. So I'm going to talk today about the use of electrical stimulation to restore bladder function following spinal cord injury. And uh, as a result of my activities that Dr. Coolen introduced, I have a number of financial disclosures that I'm required to make. The most important of which for today is that I'm the inventor on and can receive potential royalties from patents on pudendal nerve stimulation for control of bladder function. And I'll mention the use of uh, pudendal nerve stimulation as one approach to restore bladder function following spinal cord injury. So bladder function conceptually is relatively simple, but as we'll see uh, when we look a little bit deeper at the neural control of bladder function is remarkably complex really two different functions. First, continence, which is low pressure expansion of the volume of the bladder, coupled with dynamic contraction of the sphincter, and micturition, which is contraction of the smooth muscle of the bladder, also called the detrusor, coupled with relaxation of the external urethral sphincter. So this shows an uh, outline of what I'll talk about today. First, I'll introduce you to the anatomy just at a relatively superficial level, as this is required to understand some of the uh, challenges of using electrical stimulation to restore bladder function. Talk about in able-bodied persons, the synergy between contraction of the bladder and the sphincter. What changes following spinal cord injury? And then finally, two examples of using electrical stimulation to restore bladder function following spinal cord injury. So this shows a diagram of the spinal innervation of the bladder. And what's, what I find quite remarkable here is that innervation of the lower urinary tract includes uh, somatic innervation via the pudendal nerve, parasympathetic innervation via the pelvic nerve, and sympathetic innervation via the hypogastric nerve. So involving both the autonomic and the somatic nervous systems. <clears throat> 
And I highlight two locations where we'll talk about electrical stimulation. First is on the sacral ventral roots or sacral anterior root stimulation, SARS. And the second location is on the pudendal nerve or the branches of the pudendal nerve, pudendal nerve stimulation or PNS. So in healthy individuals, there's a synergy between active activity in the smooth muscle of the bladder and activity in the strided muscle of the sphincter. Diagrammed here is bladder pressure as a function of time and external urethral sphincter electromyographic activity as a function of time as the bladder is slowly filled in an able-bodied volunteer. And what you see is this low pressure storage so accommodating relatively large volume, 300 cc's in this instance, with very little increase in pressure. And that storage function is accomplished, is augmented by activation of the striated muscle of the sphincter as reflected by the increase in EMG. Then the individual voluntarily initiates bladder emptying or voiding, and we see an increase in pressure in the bladder, coupled with a reduction in activity in the external urethral sphincter. So synergy, either low pressure in the bladder coupled with activity in the sphincter or high pressure in the bladder coupled with a lack of activity in the sphincter. However, this is disrupted following spinal cord injury. First, there's a loss of voluntary control. Individuals can no longer voluntarily initiate that bladder emptying phase. And this loss of voluntary control is accompanied by the development of some abnormal reflex behaviors. The first is called bladder hyperreflexia, or more properly described as neurogenic detrusor overactivity. And this is the contraction of the bladder, so this is bladder pressure as a function of time, at low bladder volumes. So in contrast to the low pressure storage that we saw earlier, at low volumes, you get contraction of the bladder as a result of this hyperreflexia. This is accompanied by bladder sphincter dyssynergia. So shown here is a recording from an individual spinal cord injury of external urethral sphincter electromyographic activity and bladder pressure. And you see that as the bladder contracts, rather than a reduction in activity in the sphincter as we saw in the able-bodied individual, here we see an increase in activity in the external urethral sphincter reflecting of, of a dyssynergic relationship between these two muscles. And this results in urinary retention and poor voiding because as the bladder is contracting, it's contracting against a closed outlet. So you get poor bladder emptying. This pathophysiology gives rise to a number of health consequences, including incontinence, which can lead to skin breakdown, frequent urinary tract infections, and in extreme cases, damage to the bladder and damage to the upper urinary tract. This is an example of an X-ray of an individual's bladder. So the bladder has been filled with a radio opaque substance and we can see the, the contents inside the bladder here. And as that bladder contracts as a result of hyperreflexia, it's actually pushing that radio opaque substance backwards up through the ureter. And this can eventually lead to kidney damage. And in this particular uh, X-ray, we also see the source of spinal cord injury in this individual. This is a bullet lodged in their spinal column. So significant health to the pathophysiological changes that occur in the bladder. Not surprisingly, the restoration of bladder and bowel function is a high of high priority to individuals both with quadriplegia and with paraplegia. In the case of paraplegia, second to only sexual function. And I think somewhat surprising to many people more important to individuals with spinal cord injury than restoring uh, their, their capability to walk. So what I've shown you so far is the anatomy of the lower urinary tract contains both autonomic and somatic components. In able-bodied individuals, there's synergy between contraction of the bladder and relaxation of the sphincter to produce emptying or relaxation of the bladder and contraction of the sphincter to produce continence or storage. These are disrupted following spinal cord injury, resulting in paralysis, the inability to voluntarily initiate bladder emptying. Hyperreflexive contractions of the bladder at low bladder volumes, contributing to urinary incontinence. And bladder sphincter dyssynergia, leading to very inefficient emptying or urinary retention. 
So as a result of these challenges, there have been a number of different approaches using electrical stimulation to restore bladder function following spinal cord injury, with the ultimate goal of restoring both continence or storage and mixturition or voiding or bladder emptying. These have included sacral anterior or ventral spinal nerve root stimulation, and I'll describe this in further detail. Sacral neuromodulation, which is quite effective at treating overactive bladder in individuals without spinal cord injury, but has only modest effects and inconsistent effects following spinal cord injury. Tibial nerve stimulation, which can be delivered percutaneously, also modest, uh, very few studies in spinal cord injury. Ongoing studies of epidural spinal cord stimulation uh, to restore bladder function following spinal cord injury. And another approach which I'll discuss is the use of pudendal nerve stimulation to restore both continence and bladder emptying. So first looking at sacral anterior root stimulation. This therapy actually includes two components. The first of which is surgical transection of the dorsal roots or the posterior roots. So the sensory information from the periphery is coming up from the pelvis, the bladder, the skin of the pelvis, the genitals, entering the spinal cord through the sacral dorsal roots. And these are surgically transected through a procedure called dorsal rhizotomy. And this very effectively treats these abnormal hyperreflexive and dyssynergic reflexes. This is coupled with electrical stimulation of the anterior or ventral roots that contain the motor axons going, the parasympathetic axons going to the bladder, as well as the somatic axons going to the sphincter. This slide shows the technology uh, made by a company in the United Kingdom called Fine Tech Medical. And includes a fully implanted radio frequency powered and controlled stimulator, a series of electrodes which are implanted on those sacral ventral roots, and an external controller that the user can uh, use to, to energize the system when, they're, when they choose to empty their bladder. However, the anatomy produces quite a challenge to bladder emptying. As I said, when we stimulate these ventral roots electrically, both the small diameter act parasympathetic axons going to the bladder and the large diameter somatic, ap somatic axons going to the sphincter are contained within the same nerve roots. And we know that the threshold current to stimulate an axon is inversely proportional to its diameter. This shows a cross section through the sacral nerve root these large profiles are the large somatic efferent fibers innervating the sphincter, and the small diameter axons are those parasympathetic axons innervating the bladder. So as the intensity of electrical stimulation is increased, first, these large diameter axons going to the sphincter will be stimulated, causing contraction of that sphincter and closure of the outlet. And as the stimulus intensity is further increased, only then will the small diameter axons be stimulated, causing contraction of the bladder. So conventional stimulation delivered at this location would cause simultaneous and dyssynergic contraction of both the bladder and the sphincter. Well, Giles Brindley, who was knighted for this activity by the Queen of England, came up with an intermittent stimulation paradigm to effectively empty the bladder by taking advantage of the differences in contraction and relaxation speeds between the smooth muscle of the detrusor or bladder and the strided muscle of the sphincter. And that's diagrammed here. So stimulation is delivered intermittently in these bursts. Each burst causes contraction of the sphincter and contraction of the bladder. But when the burst subsides, the sphincter relaxes quickly because it's a somatic striated muscle, whereas the bladder pressure relaxes very slowly because it's a smooth muscle. Then a second burst of stimulation is delivered, again, causing tr only transient activation of the sphincter, but perpetual activation of the bladder. And you see that in these times between bursts, the bladder pressure exceeds the sphincter pressure and you get intermittent flow of urine. 
in what's called post-stimulus voiding, because the flow actually occurs when the stimulation is off. Here's an example of that. These are now real data. This shows you the pressure inside the bladder, the pressure inside the abdomen, and the difference between those two. So this would be the true pressure across the bladder wall, as well as the flow exiting the urethra. This is a recording of the EMG in the pelvic floor, but really what we're seeing here is simply stimulation artifact from the application of these bursts of stimulation. And you see the burst of stimulation causes a contraction of the bladder. And when that burst of stimulation subsides, then we see flow of urine out of the urethra. And this post-stimulus voiding is quite effective at producing bladder emptying in individuals with spinal cord injury. The results of a multi-center clinical trial conducted in the United States are diagrammed here. This shows that the proportion of patients with residual volumes, that is how much is left in their bladder after emptying, of less than 50 milliliters. At three months after device implantation, only one person had low residual volumes without using the device, whereas 17 individuals out of 23 had it with the device on. And this performance was preserved at one year after implantation. Shown below are the mean residual volumes. Without using the device, you see residual volumes both at three and six months of 400 cc's. Basically, the bladder was not emptied at all. But with the device turned on, residual volumes of only 22 and 15 cc's. So this is a very effective way to empty the bladder. These are strong outcome data. I'm just showing you an example of those data here. And subsequent investigations have shown substantial improvements in quality of life, as well as cost effectiveness of this particular therapy. So sacral anterior root stimulation effectively produces bladder emptying. Bladder hyperreflexia and dyssynergia are treated effectively by that dorsal rhizotomy procedure, but this requires permanent transection of those sensory nerves. This leads to loss of any residual sensation from the pelvis, a loss of residual reflex erection in males, a loss of reflex defecation, which is preserved in some individuals with spinal cord injury, and prevents a presents a psychological barrier to individuals who have an injured spinal cord who are reluctant to voluntarily submit to further injury to the nervous system. As well, this requires a fairly complex surgical procedure, including a spinal laminectomy to expose these nerve roots, and that takes about 10 hours to do the entire procedure. And this, these side effects due to the rhizotomy are, in essence, unacceptable to individuals with spinal cord injury. And one of the reasons that while medically effective, this therapy has not penetrated, that it is not very many people have chosen to undergo this procedure. So now I'll talk, describe an alternative approach, which at this stage is experimental by electrically stimulating the pudendal nerve. So the goal is the same, restore bladder function, including both continents and bladder emptying, but with some constraints. Eliminate the dorsal rhizotomy, the, the one, the principal reason that individuals don't want to undergo sacral anterior root stimulation and avoid the laminectomy to produce a simpler implantation procedure. And the approach I'll describe is to electrically stimulate sensory nerves, driving spinal reflexes to produce either inhibition of the bladder and continence or contraction of the bladder and emptying. So again, sensory stimulation rather than motor stimulation. So because of time constraints, I'm going to skip the preclinical animal studies that we used to first discover that sensory nerve stimulation can be used to restore continence and bladder emptying and focus instead on translational studies in humans with spinal cord injury. So this shows an example of the effects of stimulation of the dorsal genital nerve, which innervates the glands of the penis in the male and the clitoris in the female, on bladder storage capacity in a person with spinal cord injury. 
So what's diagrammed here is bladder pressure as a function of time in three different conditions and bladder volume as a function of time. We slowly filled the bladder at a constant rate. And in the absence of any stimulation, after about seven minutes at a volume of about 250 cc's, the bladder contracted. This is a reflection of the hyperreflexy that I described earlier. If we stimulate that dorsal genital nerve continuously during bladder filling, as in this trial, you see that we get a substantial increase in bladder volume to about 500 cc's. And if we stimulate the bladder only intermittently, when we detected a contraction about to occur, you see that we get a modest increase in the maximum capacity of the bladder. So electrical stimulation of this sensory branch of the pudendal nerve produced significant increases in capacity in individuals with spinal cord injury. And the effects of doing this in a closed loop fashion relative to a continuous fashion were modest and probably don't warrant the additional complexity required to detect when those bladder contractions would occur. So that's the continent side. What about emptying? So these again show examples of bladder pressure and extramurethral sphincter activity in an individual with spinal cord injury in response to electrical stimulation delivered to the urethra. And this urethral electrical stimulation activates pudendal sensory afferents that transduce flow of urine through the urethra and activate what's called the augmenting reflex or a contraction of the bladder coupled with, we hope, synergic relaxation of the sphincter. If we stimulate in the proximal urethra, you see that we evoke a robust bladder contraction, but that's coupled with dyssynergic co coincident activation of the external urethral sphincter. So ineffective emptying. If we stimulate in the more distal urethra, we evoke a smaller contraction of the bladder but that is not accompanied by contraction of the sphincter. So here we do have synergia. So to summarize, we identify two different pudendal sensory mediated reflex pathways that either inhibited the bladder to produce continence or activated the bladder to produce emptying. These reflexes appear to be preserved in individuals with chronic spinal cord injury and they can be activated by electrical stimulation. They provide to some potential substrates for restoration of bladder emptying, but the emptying efficiency presently as a result of driving this augmenting reflex is insufficient. So in the last minute, I'd like to describe some ongoing work we're doing to try to increase this emptying efficiency. And our approach came from an observation of normal voiding that occurs in the rat. So this shows bladder pressure and external urethral sphincter activity in a rat during voiding. So the bladder contracts. And in contrast to what I showed you in the human, in the rat, there is phasic activity of the external urethral sphincter. And this phasic activity of the external urethral sphincter is necessary to produce efficient voiding. This shows you the proportion of volume in the bladder that was voided under control conditions or following elimination of this phasic activity of the sphincter, either by transecting the motor nerve going to the sphincter or by blocking transect, uh, contraction of skeletal muscle with alpha bungarotoxin. And in both cases, we see a precipitous reduction in voiding efficiency. So this inspired the idea of using electrical stimulation to reanimate this phasic activity of the sphincter. And that's shown here. So here's control voiding efficiency, again, in a rat. Bilateral transection of the, the nerve innervating the external urethral sphincter leads to a precipitous reduction in voiding efficiency. And that can be restored by either unilateral or bilateral stimulation of that transected nerve to reanimate that phasic activity. So to summarize, spinal cord injury results in loss of voluntary control, hyperreflexia, and dyssynergia. Restoration of continence and micturition is a high priority for persons with spinal injury, 
Sacral anterior root stimulation combined with dorsal rhizotomy is effective, but it's highly invasive and results in loss of remaining sensation and reflexes. Pudendal nerve stimulation can activate both inhibitory reflexes to increase bladder capacity, producing continence, or excitatory reflexes to produce contraction and voiding. And phasic activation of the external urethral sphincter is a potential approach to enhance bladder emptying. In addition to thanking all the individuals who uh, participated in the studies that I described today, also like to support, uh, thank you for the financial support from the NIH, the Craig Nielsen Foundation, and Galvani Bioelectronics. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Warren. That was a terrific talk. Um, I guess I, I can start out with a question and I'll hand it over to, uh, to Lika. Um, have, you, have you attempted the uh, artificial physics um, activation of external sphincter and spinal cord injury models yet? That was all in control, in control rats, right? Yeah, so we, we have not yet done this in, in uh, individuals with spinal cord injury. We have done it in cats. So in, in similar to humans and in contrast to rats and dogs, when cats void, they relax the sphincter. You don't see this phasic activation of the sphincter. Under anesthesia, the voiding efficiency in a cat is typically about 50 to 60%, so relatively low. And we found that in that animal model, by addition of this phasic activity of the sphincter, we can increase that voiding efficiency, uh, suggesting that this is a viable approach in an animal like human who doesn't normally use phasic activation of the sphincter. Right. But the next next step, of course, is to do this in humans. Right. Thanks, Lika. Thank you. This was a terrific talk. Really super fascinating. Um, I have a question uh, related to, you were talking about the different stimulation parameters required for the, the large nerve fibers, small nerve fibers, when you were talking about the ventral root. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you see something similar uh, with the stimulation of the dorsal root. And in addition to that, there is some evidence, I believe in CAT uh, models, that there are some changes as a result of spinal cord injury in the composition of the large and small nerve fibers within the dorsal root of the pedemonal nerve. So in other words, do you think that therefore stimulation parameters um, need to be different in a spinal cord injured uh, patient than in a control, in an intact individual? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kulin. So, so first, just to be clear, the, the example that I showed here was of a ventral root. Right. But if we transected the, the dorsal root, we would see something similar. We would see a complement of both large and small diameter afferents, and we would also see many, many unmyelinated, very, very small C fiber afferents. This relationship between threshold current and diameter is, is ubiquitous, so it would apply to sensory stimulation as well as motor stimulation. And in our situation, it actually plays to our advantage. Because when we stimulate the pudendal nerve, which in this diagram is out here in the periphery, the largest diameter axons are actually the sensory fibers. I didn't do a very good job drawing this picture because I was I, I drew the, the I drew the e, the black efferents a little bigger than the than the blue uh, sensory afferents, but the largest afferents excuse me the largest fibers are the sensory afferents that we're actually trying to stimulate. So it actually plays to our advantage when we're trying to do sensory stimulation. Yes, there, there are some uh, data, and I, I'm familiar with those data on the motor side. I'm not familiar with data on the sensory side that shows a change in the properties of axons. And this uh, actually results in a alteration in the recruitment order of those axons to electrical stimulation. So this curve that, I, that I'm showing you here can actually be altered in individuals with spinal cord injury as a result of the, cha the physical changes in the properties of the axon. Wonderful, but there's nothing in your rat studies to, to suggest that that would be the case um, in, in your preclinical findings? We have not seen it in the preclinical findings, no. That's great, that's good, wonderful. 
Okay, um, Mike, I'm not sure we can see whether there are any questions from the audience, whether it can be placed in the Q&A box or... I haven't seen anything in, in there. Rashawn, she, you should correct me if I have. Let me, let me ask though another question. Yeah. Uh, and this is, a, this is a question, uh, Warren, that really is, again, related to, to Lika's research and what I know about um, sexual function. And uh, it's really whether patients uh, that uh, undergo the pudendal, pudendal nerve stimulation show, uh, spinal cord injury patients show any effects on sexual uh, reflexes or uh, sexual function. Yeah, so there has been a, there there has been a little bit of work. Uh, this is not our work, looking at uh, pudendal nerve stimulation for either creating erection in the male or uh, lubrication in the female, and this is again exploiting a reflex that's already there because if you mechanically stimulate the glands in a male you can produce a, a reflex erection and similarly if you mechanically stimulate the clitoris in a, in a female you can produce reflex lubrication in animals you you don't see this reflex unless you transect the spinal cord because there's a lot of inhibitory descending inhibitory control over these reflexes to prevent prevent you know, inadvertent lubrication and erection when it might be socially unacceptable. But in following spinal transection, you can indeed evoke reflex and lubrication reflexes from activation of sensory fibers in the pudendal nerve. So, so uh, uh, spinal cord injured patients, do they report that as part of the, uh, the effects? Yeah, so the, when, when we've done these uh, studies in, in individuals with spinal cord injury, Dr. Lehman, I, I should make clear that these are acute studies that are going on in a urodynamics lab. So no one is taking this home in a functional capacity. We're really just studying right. them in the lab. Yeah. And we have seen in some of our male participants, particularly during the continuous stimulation trials, tumescence, so the you know, engorgement of the penis, not a not a functional erection for intercourse, but engorgement occurring. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, Mike, um, if there are no questions uh, from the audience, I think uh, at this time we'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Grill for this um, wonderful presentation, fascinating data. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today. And I see uh, Roshan coming back on camera. So <laughs> yeah, I don't see any question, but it was very nice talk. This was great, wonderful. Okay, let's uh, let's give Dr. Grill a round of uh, yeah. virtual or real applause. Uh, I can't see any virtual way of doing it, so I'm just gonna. Thank you, thank you so much. Mark. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Thank you guys.